I now have the pleasure to move on to uh, to to, intro to welcome here uh, Fag Young Chang for the Pecha Kucha session. So I'm happy I'm not part of that session. That's a stressful one for me. So I'm just going to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Effie, for that um, opening talk. So moving on swiftly to the Pacha Kucha session. So this is going to be an adrenaline charge session. OK, get ready. So uh, Wikipedia tells me that Pacha Kucha means chit chat. Right, so my name is Pei Yong Chia. I'm a bioethicist, a steering committee member of the GFBR, as well as um, the planning committee. And I'm uh, working at the Mahidol Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit. So it's, but that's part of the University of Oxford and Mahidol University in Thailand. OK, so there will be five speakers in this session. OK, and everyone gets 20 slides. And the slides, every slide is 20 minutes. So the thing about Pecha Kucha is the slides move. Sorry? 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Right. <laughs> So slides move automatically. Listen, the slides move automatically. And uh, the speaker must synchronize their talk to the slides. OK? You can't ask any questions, but you can ask the speaker's questions during the tea break. So this is going to be um, a very fast session. You can't ask questions, but you can clap after every talk. Okay. <laughs> so I will call the speakers one by one. And then you will come up quickly, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, uh, when you're ready, you, t you say start. So the AV person here, where somewhere there, will be able to start uh, uh, the, the slide rolling. Okay. So the five speakers, please get ready. Okay. This is going to be very quick. Right. I'm going to introduce the first speaker now. The first speaker is um, Athenea Sears. Edgar Arfo from the University of Ghana. Please. Uh, that name is Ejako. It's, it's quite difficult. Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive my dad for giving me that very difficult name. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, Say, I'm supposed to say start. Say start, yeah. say, So say start. <laughs> so I am Athanasius. I'm from the University of Ghana. And I'm presenting a paper that I've chosen to title. Don't, OK, start, please. So the title is Don't Tempt Me, I Can Bite. And it is a paper that analyzes an imbalance of power ethics between the University of Ghana and the Data Commission of Ghana, and how this impacts data uh, research in uh, health. And I'm going to present this imbalance in the form of uh, two tensions. The first tension is uh, community engagement when it comes to collecting AI data for research. And the second is uh, institutional control of data that is collected for research purposes. And these two tensions are going to come up in the form of uh, this case study. In October 2021, the University of Ghana and the IFPRI started a research they called the Accra Urban Adolescent Nutrition Study. And the purpose of this study was to examine the dietary requirements, their nutritional status, the physical activity patterns and the food environment of about a thousand participants aged between 12 and 19 who were selected from various communities in Accra, that is the capital of Ghana. A major requirement of this study was that participants were supposed to wear a GPS fitted belt for the entire duration of the study, that is 10 days, and then on the 10th day, uh, the participants would have their blood samples taken for analysis as part of the study. Now, fast forward. On the 8th of June of this year, 
the Data Commission of Ghana ordered the University of Ghana to halt the study they had begun already and to contact their partners and sponsors and also conduct a data protection impact assessment to assess risks from the study. And what were their reasons? Some parents and some teachers had raised concerns about the kind of data that was being collected because to them it was very intrusive. Uh, the University of Ghana was not registered as a data controller and it was also determined that the university had breached contracts with its uh, sponsors because they asked them to obey and comply with local rules. But interestingly, ethics was not a problem here because informed consent had been sought and the study had been approved by Noguchi and it, was, it had received support also from the Ghana Health Service and the Ghana Education Service and these are not mean uh, institutions, very powerful ones. So if ethics was not a problem, what is the main problem then? I think it was a problem of power, legality. It was a problem of one very powerful institution telling some other smaller institution, look, you better comply or I'm going to bite you because I can show you where power lies. So it was just an issue of uh, power and it was from the Data Commission. The Data Commission was established by law to protect personal data and to specify the legal means of acquiring, holding, using, and disclosing data. So that is their mandate. And to fulfill this mandate, the Data Commission of Ghana has these powers. To make administrative arrangements it considers appropriate for the discharge of its duties, to investigate complaints and to determine those complaints in a manner that they consider fair, and also to keep and maintain what they call a data protection register. Now, if you look at one and two, it means that the Data Commission of Ghana has too much power, way too much power to determine what is appropriate, to determine what is fair, and because of this power, excess of power, it is able to interfere and intrude in some other activities of other institutions. And in this case, they use their pretext of community, the, the concerns raised by the parents and teachers. And the concern raised by the parents and teachers raises a question of community engagement. How far should you go when it comes to engaging community? How many people should be engaged when we are collecting uh, AI data for research? I think most of these conflicts arise from the fact that uh, AI is quite novel in some parts of our world and there's the need to make strict laws to guide and regulate. But it, I think it also gives us an opportunity to make certain redefin uh, definitions, to define ethical requirements, and to define the boundaries of community engagement. I'd want to conclude with a, a high from my university, the University of Ghana, uh, very beautiful university and very good. And also to say thank you to the the entire GFBR team that made it possible for me to be here. And we say big thank you to Dr. Cesar Achire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. So the second speaker is Dr. Dorcas Akinpelu from University of Ibarra, Nigeria. The title is Ethical Concerns in the Use of, use of AI for Patient Safety Research and Examination of the Adequacy of Nigerian Laws. Please. Good morning, everyone. Start. My name is Dokas Akinpelu. I'm a PhD student at the Faculty of Law University of Ibadan, Nigeria. And this morning, I'll be taking us on the topic, ethical concerns in the use of artificial intelligence for patient safety research and examination of the adequacy of Nigerian laws. Evidence have shown that there is an unacceptable number of preventable medical errors that is happening globally. And these errors have a way of impacting patient safety. When we have an understanding of the cause of these errors, it helps in developing viable solutions and building safer healthcare systems. And unfortunately, AI could help us in this regard. But the use of AI for our patient safety research raises some ethical concerns. 
one of which is the possibility of barriers and discrimination that arises when underrepresented data is put into the AI algorithms and the difficulty of assigning responsibility and liability, which arises from the opaque nature and unpredictable nature of um, black box AI. The third ethical concern is the uh, difficulty in obtaining informed consent, and uh, this comes from the black box problem that uh, arises from the novelty and unpredictable and the um, problem of many hands that um, is in AI. Now, there is also another problem, which is the fact that AI has the potential to erode confidentiality and it violates patient um, privacy and data security. It disregards autonomy, particularly when the data subjects are made available, the data the results are made available to third parties. Now, given the stated ethical concerns, it is imperative that there is a comprehensive edge research governance and regulation to protect research subjects while improving healthcare quality. And given the laws that we have in Nigeria, there is no specific law that regulates the use of AI in patient safety research, but we have a patchwork of laws that um, protect, that assist privacy Privacy as a fundamental right that um, protects confidentiality and all. But are these laws, are they adequate to address the ethical concerns that have been raised? Definitely, the answer is no. These laws are not adequate to address the raised ethical concerns. Firstly, why it is true that there is a patchwork of laws from which guidance can be gotten, there is no specific law that caters for the identified ethical concerns in the use of AI for patient safety research. And also, these laws, do, they don't uh, contemplate patient safety and AI when they were made. For instance, the NDP health that we have is not primarily on research. The regulations are built on national laws that are committed to paying attention to protecting personal data in other sectors apart from health. And also, it is not even clear how these existing guidelines that we have are going to be interpreted in the context of patient safety research and the use of AI. Now, what can we do to ensure that these ethical concerns are well catered for? Being a complex and varied system with diverse players and organizations, it is uh, imperative that there is a, uh, a governance framework that we better cater for the ethical concerns that has been raised. Now, having a governance framework, we ensure that these ethical concerns, uh, that it will ensure that ethical principles, directions, and rules are in existence. It will also ensure that the rights and duties of each stakeholders are appropriately delineated and that diverse circumstances can be accommodated, leading to expansive coverage and because of the advantage of collaboration and oversight and inclusion, then there's going to be um, likelihood of general acceptance by the people. Now, what does this mean for us? It means that if we, we maximize the use of AI in patient safety research, there is need to cater for the identified ethical concerns and many more which may evolve as AI advances. And to achieve this, we need an enabling environment we need smart and effective regulation. We need regulatory standards for new AI technologies. And we also need a dedicated oversight body. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Dorcas. Beautifully done. Next speaker is um, Irvin Sina Silala who minds the machines, developing a governance framework for the pre-market authorization of responsible AI applications in healthcare in South Africa. Irvin. Good day. Um, I'm Dr. Ivan. Me and my colleague, Dr. Donnelly, uh, grappled with the question, who minds the machine? as we sought out to delineate the governance framework for pre-market authorization of AI in South Africa. AI uh, has huge potential and has found use in different specialties in healthcare. The majority of approved AI software are earmarked for radiology. Associated with this huge potential 
lies substantial risk to ethics and human rights norm. Therefore, there is a need. Therefore, there is a need to balance beneficence of AI use in healthcare against maleficence of AI in healthcare. More so for AI, that is autonomous capabilities. AI seeks to emulate the human brain by thinking rationally, giving outputs and recommendations. It operates with varying levels of human control, ranging from unsupervised, semi-supervised, to fully supervised. And this has a bearing on ethical and human rights con uh, constraints. South Africa, a low to mid-income country, has a further layer of constraints within the governance framework of AI. It is outdated legislation which provide unclear regulatory pathways and in insufficient post-deployment surveillance mechanism. In response to the global ethical concern, a plethora of ethical guidelines were published. However, there are soft law documents which are not legally enforceable. They are prone to ethic washings and critically, they lack a vital input from low to mid-income countries. Furthermore, they do not uh, translate into a practical usable tool. Hence, there is a need to provide a remedy which convert these ethical guidelines and human rights guidelines into ethical and human rights impact assessments together with audits that will seek to provide for total product life cycle monitoring of AI within the healthcare. Impact assessment seek to detect harm that arises from AI use proactively rather than reactively. They are developed by different stakeholders in healthcare, which include research ethic committees, and they are to be conducted at various stages of the research. The research ethic committees will provide valuable input to impact assessment at the beginning of the, the research and at the end of the research. And the impact assessment who identify the risk, the, the norms that are at risk of derogation, and provide ways to mitigate this risk. Furthermore, they will, prov they will determine the beneficence of AI in line with local health needs. The Research Ethics Committee will provide input and planning of the review of the project at the beginning of the research, and at the conclusion of the research, they will follow up on the research uh, project. They will also independently assess and inform regulators of the conformity of AI to this local, to the local ethical and human, right, uh, human rights concerns. Critically, they, they can critically assess the scientific quality of AI software in healthcare. They can also dialogue with the general public on ethical issues affecting AI. Audits are a systematic review to measure reliability, safety, and the quality of AI output in clinical practice, and together with impact assessment, seeks to provide for transparency and improve trust in AI software use in healthcare. All this, together with impact assessment, can be conducted in regulatory sandboxes under the strict supervision of the regulator to minimize widespread risk to the general populace. Impact assessment should be incorporated within regulation to provide for enforceability. Impact assessment together with audits should be conducted to provide a total product life cycle monitoring, which begins at the design phase, continues in the development, validation, certification, and post-deployment surveillance of AI. Impact assessment have recently been incorporated uh, within the Algorithmic Accountability Act of 2022 in the United States to provide for enforceability. This was, it will seek to provide for human-centric, responsible, trustworthy, and governable AI. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Nicely done. Uh, next speaker is uh, Matimba Swana from University of Bristol. The title is Future Nanomedicines, Building a Regulatory Framework for the First in Human Nanoswarm Cancer Clinical Trial. Please, Matimba. Good 
morning. Um, let's start. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about a new uh, technology, and um, cell division is something that happens naturally within the human body. However, cancer occurs when abnormal cells divide in an abnormal way, which can lead to uh, benign or mal malignant tumors. And one way to treat them is chemotherapy. Traditional chemotherapy is systemic, so this means it targets both the healthy and the cancer cells which can lead to potential side effects. And um, this is one of the reasons most researchers are looking at a more precise um, treatment pathway. Uh, cancer nanomedicine is the medical application of nanotechnology, and it deals with matter between one and 100 nanometers. So this is essentially what a tennis ball is to the Earth. And for context, a red blood cell is about 7,000 nanometers wide. Um, nanoparticles can be used to assist in the delivery of chemotherapy and because of their nano size they can move through membranes and um, get to the tumor and be able to deliver chemotherapy and um, it's a much more targeted treatment however only one percent of nanoparticles reach a solid tumor so a systems approach can aid in clinical translation and this is where you can use computational models to select the nanoparticle design, such as loading, size, and coating. And this changes where it goes in the body. Beyond this, researchers are looking at actually controlling nanoparticles, so not just selecting for design. And nanorobots are nano-sized entities that can um, be controlled and um, you, they, you can control their interactions with their environment. Um, what I'm looking at specifically is nanoswarms. So nanoswarms are inspired by swarms in nature, so you can use these bio-inspired algorithms so that uh, these nanoparticles or nanorobots can find and target a tumor cell and they can make decisions about a tumor using these different types of behaviors such as navigation and aggregation. So micro nanorobots can use three methods of eradicating a tumor. They can carry, deliver, and release drug in a tumor, similar to current nanocarriers and they can activate or simulate the immune system against the tumor, similar to immunotherapies. Um, they can also me mechanically kill a tumor and induce tumor cell death. So what would the future look like? A potential future is patient gets diagnosed with cancer and is able to print their nanoswarm prescription uh, using their own genomic profile. And once they've used their 3D printer and the nanoswarms have repaired the damage, the patient is completely clear from cancer. So where are we now? This is not just science fiction. Um, <laughs> there are in vivo trials that have been done where uh, tiny robots were used to clear pneumonia in mice and a micro robotics lab in um, the US have had uh, FDA designated use device um, for a rare pediatric brain disorder in a single patient. So how do we classify these? Are they a drug, a surgical innovation, a medical device, a software as a medical device, or something else? Um, if anybody has an answer, please let me know. I asked the MHRA in the UK, and uh, they don't know. Uh, so there is this dual use dilemma of, di of nanoswarms. They do sound incredible because of the knowledge and targeted treatments that we can get from them. However, there are concerns around privacy, confidentiality, the enhancement versus therapy, um, the militarization, as well as health I I enhancing health inequalities. So some key considerations, we need to create a set of standards for AI-driven cancer therapies, such as nanoswarms, and it's important to embed bioethics um, in policy at the beginning, not once this is already deployed and out there, and ensuring that regulation doesn't hinder innovation. And some of the key regulation and, and guidance domains that we're looking at are these six um, key areas, including stakeholders. So how do we co-design um, this new technology with the people who are going to be using it, um, as well as uh, the materials that are being used and um, the 
the process that we use. So what I want to leave you with today, um, taking into consideration that we have inequalities within cancer prevention, treatment and diagnosis, and the way clinical trials look like today, what should the first in human clinical trial of these nanoswarms look like in cancer patients? Thank you. Thank you very much, Matimba. Another very nice uh, talk. So the last speaker of the session is Serene Ong from National University of Singapore. Her talk is International AI Research, the Issue of Moral Pluralism. Serene, please. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, start. Hi, good morning. My name is Serene Ong and I'm a PhD student at the Center for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. So my presentation focuses on the issue of moral pluralism in international AI research. International cooperation uh, can increase the efficiency of AI research, avoid duplicative work and optimize the promises of AI. Large data sets are required to improve accuracy of AI decision making. LMICs can benefit by building upon existing research. However, transnational approach AI creates conflict between harmonization of principles and moral pluralism. A recent paper noted 470 ethical guidelines. It is unclear how AI research ought to be governed when regulatory frameworks between sectors and countries differ. So a universal framework for responsible AI could help focus AI research and build trust across transnational boundaries, commonalities in the ethical values and principles that underpin published frameworks suggest that a core set of values or principles is feasible. However, much of the early efforts to produce frameworks has emanated from HICs. The US and UK alone accounted for more than a third of published guidelines. Very few frameworks applicable to the specific context of AI research in LMICs have been published, which is problematic. First, AI research must be localized. While open sharing of expertise and resources from HICs can aid LMICs in the development of their AI initiatives and ethical frameworks, structural constraints preclude the straightforward transposition of frameworks from other countries. Second, cultural differences invite us to think about the place of plural values in the development of overarching frameworks. For instance, Asian frameworks reveal a greater societal emphasis, while there is greater focus in the European guidelines on the protection of individual rights. So differences in perceptions of what AI means and how it should be regulated can lead to differences in the ways AI research is, is undertaken. For example, an, exa an emphasis on the common good of data sharing could conflict with the right space requirement to protect personal data. So I caution against a universal framework to regulate AI research, arguing that there is value in a diversity of normative and cultural perspectives, especially in research. Distinct perspectives can contribute innovative and novel ways of approaching problems and discovering solutions. So I, I suggest a way forward through a two-level framework. It is grounded by a core statement of common or shared values. Identified core values provide a continuity between different countries organ and organizations on which trust and practical regulations can be laid upon. A secondary procedural layer is configured as a flexible space for accommodating contextual features, local nuances, and reasonable disagreement. This layer accommodates both shared and plural values in a consistent process for practical regulation and decision making. So rather than a universal set of values or principles, harmonization ought to instead be directed towards procedural engagement in decision making. It is more practically feasible and ethically defensible to agree on practical processes for addressing ethical disagreement within a research project. 
This two-level framework is also respectful of distinctive national strategies for governance and AI research prioritization. It enfolds a richer range of cultures and perspectives, increasing the complexity and depth of ethical analysis in AI research. To achieve this, we need to recognize the possibility of engagement across differences. The challenge is to gain consensus around shared value commitments in ways that can accommodate and respect the pluralism across transnational frameworks, and to do so in ways that share research ownership and investments across countries. This work is supported by the Singapore Ministry of Health, National Medical Research Council under its Science, Health and Policy Relevant Ethics or SHAPES program. So a special shout out to the SHAPES team, Tamra Laisat, Michael Dunn, Victor Koh and Joseph Liu, without whom I wouldn't be standing here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shireen. So it's time for the tea break, ladies and gentlemen. So let's give a big hand to all the five speakers again.